So I, I will uh, continue from where we left off yesterday. Yesterday was more general, setting scenes, etc. Uh, today is more about strategy of um, how we can develop useful photoantimicrobials. Um, and I will base um, most of the material on the, uh, the kind of phenothiazinium class, the methylene blue derivatives. That's where I've been uh, working for almost 30 years. So I'll speak a little bit about selectivity because there's a very obvious correlation. Um, then I'll talk about conventional drug resistance because that's really the, um, the, big, uh, the big problem that we have and that we can address, I think, with uh, the uh, photoantimicrobials. And then I'll talk quite a bit about how we design photosensitizers, the process, um, and what we can do, how we can improve structures. Um, and uh, a lot will kind of, I hope, will correlate with what Mauricio said yesterday about uh, interactions. So <clears throat> I won't say very much about selectivity, but this is a very, very obvious thing. Methylene blue and dyes similar to methylene blue have been used to um, elucidate structures under a microscope because they are, they are very, very good biological stains. Uh, and they are uh, selectively and very rapidly taken up by simple microorganisms relative to uh, host cells. So if you take a, uh, a sputum sample, for example, this is, uh, you see here, this is a sputum sample, so it's coughed up by the, the patient. Um, and you can stain it with something like methylene blue, or you can use crystal violet or malachite green. All of these positively charged uh, dyes, which also happen to be uh, photosensitizers, so that's a kind of happy coincidence for us. Um, and you see that the larger cells that you can just about see are not stained, but the small uh, microbial cells uh, are stained. This particular slide is one of, uh, from a, an AIDS patient who has uh, pneumocystis pneumonia. And you can see this is, uh, these organisms used to be called pneumocystis carinii. So when the AIDS outbreak occurred in the uh, late 70s, early 80s, pneumocystis carinii pneumonia was, the, the, was one of the indicating factors for HIV uh, infection. Didn't realize it at the time. Um, but again, very happy coincidence, the standard laboratory stain for pneumocystis carinii, pneumocystis gyrovecii, as it's called now, um, is toledine blue been that, that stain for 50 years, perhaps longer. Okay, so again, a very obvious correlation. Um, and tomorrow when I talk about the application to disease, um, which will be more about how we approach, how we can actually treat practical diseases, um, one of the recommendations really would be that we can use toledine blue to treat pneumocystis pneumonia, because it's very specific for the organism. And that's already there. Nobody's done this yet. I can't afford to do it, but we should do this. So there are other um, different examples. Staph aureus, uh, Klebsiella, so Staph aureus, as we said yesterday, is a gram-positive. Klebsiella is a gram-negative. And Klebsiella pneumonia is a very, very uh, difficult organism to deal with now in hospitals. Um, it causes an awful lot of pneumonia, and uh, there's an awful lot of um, carbapenemase presence in uh, Klebsiella. Carbapenemase is, if you like, a very modern um, version of the standard beta-lactamase. Works in the same way. Um, but a lot of Klebsiella produce carbapenemases. We can't treat Klebsiella pneumonia with beta-lactams very often. And so, again, we can see we can stain it very, very easily with methylene blue. Um, and uh, these things do not uh, last very long when you put the light on. I've got a, an example from some of the work that we did with uh, Klebsiella a little bit later. So gram-positive, gram-negative bacteria, and as you know, Candida albicans, a very common yeast, uh, common fungus in humans. So it causes all sorts of different things like thrush 
or uh, you can get uh, skin diseases caused by uh, candida. Again, very easily, very strongly stained by uh, methylene blue. So in terms of selectivity, there isn't really a problem at all. Um, it's one of those, it just is. Okay, that's how it works. Um, and the, uh, it's a very fortunate thing that all of these biological stains, which have been around for well over 100 years, probably almost 100, and probably 150 years now, um, which also happen to be photosensitizers. Okay. Now, don't forget, while I'm talking today, we also always have to think about the useful range. And again, this is a, if you like, a manifestation of what we just saw. All of those stain, all of those cells were stained uh, very dark blue. Okay, so all of them will absorb. All of those cells now will be can be treated in this therapeutic window. Okay, so with uh, red light, very, uh, very easy to do. Now, I said that one of the important things about photoantimicrobials is the activity against conventional drug resistance. Drug resistance is a huge problem in the world. It doesn't matter where you are, whether there's very affluent kind of healthcare provision, whether it's like uh, in the UK and some other countries in Europe where it's free healthcare. If you're sick, you just go to a hospital, you treat it, it doesn't cost anything. Um, well, it does cost, but it doesn't cost you anything. Um, or if, you've, if you're in a, a developing country and there's very little health care, the same sort of problems will occur in hospitals. The same organisms uh, will occur. So until perhaps 10 years ago, there was a huge problem in hospitals, in, certainly in Europe uh, and the States, with uh, organisms like MRSA, methicillin-resistant Staphylococcus aureus, which is a standard gram-positive um, bacterium with some extra resistance mechanisms, quite a few, as it turns out, resistance mechanisms. Another organism which caused problems was something called Clostridium difficile. We talked about Clostridium yesterday. Um, both of these are resistant to a, a great deal of, of different uh, antibiotics, antibacterial agents. <laughs> you didn't realize it was a double act, right? <laughs> well, yes. So also with the amount of drug use for treatment of things like MRSA, we now see, or what we have been seeing recently, uh, emergence of what's called vancomycin resistance. So vancomycin is a, quite a, um, a toxic antibiotic. It's a natural product antibiotic. Um, which was discovered in the 1950s. But um, because of the toxicity, it wasn't used a great deal. It's also quite expensive, so again, not used very much. Because of that, um, vancomycin retained its activity against uh, Staph aureus, whether it was um, susceptible Staph aureus, if you like, penicillin susceptible, or methicillin resistant. So vancomycin was quite often used for MRSA treatment. If you had MRSA septicemia, you would be given IV vancomycin. <clears throat> because of the MRSA problem and the increasing drug use, we now see vancomycin intermediate staph aureus, so it, it's more resistant than it was, and in some cases, we will see vancomycin resistant staph aureus, so vancomycin no longer works in that case against MRSA, so that's a problem. Okay? In 2015, um, resistant infection killed, as we see, 33,000 people in Europe. That figure is likely to go much, much higher by the kind of middle of this century. You're talking about millions of people who are no longer able to be treated with, with standard antibiotics. So we know that our photosensitizers, our photoantimicrobials, make very short work of bacteria. It doesn't matter about the resistance mechanisms. Okay? So that's really where we're coming from. Um, but there has been a slight change because uh, changes in hospital policies, in cleanliness, in uh, making uh, medics clean their hands between seeing patients, uh, more clean, uh, more kind of cleaner hospital wards, 
different cleaning procedures. So not really anything to do with drug use, but to do with uh, kind of personal hygiene and ward hygiene. Because of that, the transmission rates with MRSA and C. diff have, have kind of come down. But in the same place, the gram-negative infections have gone up, and they are more difficult to treat than the gram-positive ones were anyway. There are fewer drugs available for those. So again, we need to focus, when we think about designing uh, new photoantimicrobials, we need to think about gram-negatives particularly. Okay, so we can, as you said uh, yesterday, I think, uh, we can decolonize patients. Okay? So if someone goes in for uh, an elective surgery, we can decolonize, uh, particularly in the nose, with our, uh, with our treatment, with methylene blue. Um, this would, would replace something like uh, mupiracin. Okay? Mupiracin is not particularly a pleasant drug. Um, it works not quite as well as it used to against MRSA, but the treatment for uh, MRSA used to be uh, applying kind of mupiracin cream into the nose. It's not very pleasant. Um, three times a day. That would usually decolonize, but again, we are now seeing uh, resistance against mupiracin. Because there's this correlation, uh, use of antibiotics or antibacterial agents and uh, rise in resistance. Another more kind of scary thing is, I talked about Staph epidermidis yesterday. This is a Staphylococcus uh, strain, a kind of a type, um, which lives on the skin. We need this on the skin to kind of maintain the skin and all the rest of it. Um, but because of drug overuse, we now see methicillin-resistant staph epidermidis. Now, on the skin, that's not a problem. But if you get an infection, if you, as I said yesterday, if you manage to push that into the, inside the, uh, under the skin, into the, the skin layers, then we can eventually get a um, septicemia, if it goes that far, um, which again is uh, just like MRSA. The source is not Staph aureus, it's the source is Staph uh, epidermidis, which is a, uh, a normal bacterium that we will all, uh, we will all have. Okay? So, how does resistance arise? Effectively, it's overuse and it's misuse of our available antimicrobials, our conventional antimicrobials. Um, if the mode of action, we talked about this yesterday, if the mode of action is um, at a single site, a very specific single site, and I'll, I'll uh, talk a little bit about um, penicillin action later on and penicillin resistance, um, then uh, a very small mutation at the active site, at the drug, site of drug action, then that will cause resistance. And once that occurs, there isn't a second site that is attacked, and so the drug is, is more or less useless. And you will also see things like, um, if you look at the fluoroquinolones, as soon as you get resistance to one fluoroquinolone, all of the other fluoroquinolones in terms of their chemistry are very, very similar in structure. So once you get resistance to one, the others don't work either. So automatically, you need to go to another class of agents. So all of this is main, means that we use, we're not using antimicrobial agents wisely. Um, Overuse of drugs, again, it's not wise to, to kind of use them for all kinds of things. Tetracyclines are very commonly used in um, kind of teenage acne. So when you've got a, um, acne that's, that's causing a problem, uh, quite often you will be prescribed uh, tetracyclines. Currently, the uh, rate of uh, resistance to tetracyclines used in acne is somewhere around between 50 and 60%. So 50 and 60 percent of, of acne, that's te of uh, tetracycline that's taken for acne, does not work. Okay, so if you take that orally, that means that your uh, your kind of uh, bacteria in your alimentary canal get a free dose of tetracycline for no positive use at all. Okay, so again, acne is a very good uh, uh, kind of target, if you like, for photoantimicrobials. The usual example that's given, sorry. Usual example that's given for ineffective drug use is prescription of penicillins, typically, for something which is actually viral. So um, tonsillitis, the, the kind of knee-jerk reaction is to prescribe uh, beta-lactams, typically something like amoxicillin or ampicillin. Um, but uh, I think it's something like 92, 
of tonsillitis cases are viral. Again, there's only about 7 or 8% window there where you get any use at all from antibiotics. And if it's not going to treat the condition, all it does is give your uh, uh, internal flora experience of drugs that they don't need, because that, again, that will encourage uh, resistance. So this is a uh, kind of slightly out of date uh, picture now. You can see there is uh, Great Britain there in the middle of Europe. You notice that? Okay, a lot of people don't think it should be there. Um, we'll see what happens on Friday. Um, the picture is probably slightly worse than that now, but the, the kind of red uh, regions, this is where we've got uh, endemic uh, carbapenemase from gram-negative bacteria. So it's a huge problem. So whichever hospital you go to uh, in these countries, then there's a good chance you'll pick up uh, some carbapenemase-producing uh, gram-negative bacteria. Um, incidentally, one of the, if you look at the kind of yellow regions here, these are very wise countries. They have um, systems where you uh, have um, single occupancy uh, for patients. So they have, if you go into hospital, you get your own room. If you get your own room, there's far less chance that you'll catch something from the person in the bed next to you because there isn't a bed next to you. So single occupancy room, they've actually thought about the environment of the hospital, so it's very good. Uh, and if you're in a, a green country, if you're in Norway, for example, even better. Okay. One of the other problems, uh, the other kind of aspects that we <clears throat> need to consider, I mentioned this yesterday, is the, uh, the use of antibacterial agents, antibiotics, in, um, in uh, agriculture, or in other words, non-human uh, use. Okay? So look at the amount of uh, use. This is in the States, 2014. The amount of use in livestock. Okay? Now, all, there's no way that all of these animals in here are sick. Okay? The greater use in here is what they call growth promotion. Growth promotion isn't exactly what it is. Um, you, they have a constant, these animals, typically uh, chickens and pigs and things, uh, have a constant low dose of antibiotic, which seems to keep them more or less reasonably healthy. Um, but all it does really is, is produce uh, typically enteric bacteria, which are resistant to whichever drug it is that they are administered. But uh, 13 and a half million tons here, uh, just over three million tons here in humans. So the, the kind of, there's a bit of a misuse going on there. I think this, is, this has been uh, legislated for in the States now, so it's presumably a little bit better. Uh, but massive overuse in agriculture causes a problem. Which is why I said yesterday that we all, always need to think about the effects in animals for whatever treatment we talk about, um, as well as humans, because they are very, they're inextricably linked. Okay, so we need to think about both sides. Okay, so use in the environment, this is just really to explain what I just talked about. Um, if you give an animal um, an antibacterial, then eventually it will come out of the other end of the animal as well, um, as well as the, the kind of bacteria that come out in the, uh, in the feces. Um, and these things are picked up, or they're washed into uh, watercourses, they're picked up by birds and transferred, all sorts of things like that. It's very difficult to, uh, to kind of control. So we need to really uh, find another method for treating animals. So again, photoantimicrobial is very, uh, very useful in that respect. Um, I think I have some s a couple of slides on treatment of mastitis in cattle using photoantimicrobial approach, which is done here in Brazil. Uh, I'll show you that uh, tomorrow. Um, one thing that was quite surprising, there was a uh, um, treatment of um, bees in China with teramycin, which is a tetracycline derivative, um, about 10 years ago, 15 years ago, I think, which led to the not totally unexpected fact that the honey that was produced ended up quite a high percentage of teramycin. And so the whole uh, kind of uh, 
amount of honey that was produced for export had to be scrapped. Obviously, you can't give people honey with kind of 5% teramycin, and it's not a good idea. Um, so you see that if, if you treat your crop or whatever it is, then eventually it turns up in the food that you produce. There are four main resistance methods. Okay, this, these are absolutely general things. Uh, we can have drug inactivation. So the best example of that would be beta-lactamase, break the drug up. Um, we can have decreased cell permeability. In other words, something happens to the structure of the cell. It could be second, uh, thickening of the cell wall, or it could be a decrease in the number of porins, the kind of little tubes that run through the, uh, the outside of the cell. Um, well, that stops uptake of the, uh, of the drug. Um, we could have target site alteration, which happens with things like uh, the ribosome and uh, tetracyclines. It's kind of a, it's called ribosomal protection. Uh, or we could have uh, active removal by efflux pumps of the drug. So most of the, uh, the, the resistance mechanisms that you read about, they'll be called all sorts of different things, but they usually fall into one of those four resistance methods. Okay, so that's the sort of thing that we need to counteract with our approach. Okay, this is just a schematic to show you that. Okay, so a drug like a penicillin gets into the cell. There's a drug inactivating enzyme, so a beta-lactamase or a carbapenemase I was just talking about. Um, that means that the drug is, is broken up. It's not the right shape anymore. It doesn't fit in the enzyme where it's supposed to be and therefore doesn't work. That obviously is destructive, so there's no, there's no way back from that. Okay. Um, modified drug target, so this would be the, the kind of ribosomal idea, for example. Um, another um, very small change in the cell wall, for example, is um, the uh, peptide involved, the dipeptide involved in cross-linking the cell wall, which is how they, the, where the penicillins attack, but also where vancomycin uh, acts. Um, it's dialanine, dialanine is the, the dipeptide uh, in vancomycin resistance, uh, resistant forms of uh, bacteria. That's no longer dialanine, dialanine, it's dialanine delactate. And if you look at the structures there, there's only two atoms different. So it's a tiny change in this very small kind of biomolecular portion of the cell wall, and that's enough to make vancomycin resistance. Okay, so alteration of drug target can be very effective. Um, we could have uh, modifications to the cell wall. As I said, if you look at uh, some forms of resistant Staph aureus, what you see is that the cell wall is thickened quite considerably. So it takes a lot, it's a lot more difficult for the uh, drugs to get, get uh, inside. Um, or we can have uh, removal of the drug from the cytoplasm by efflux pumps. Most cells will have efflux pumps, of course, so resistant forms of, um, of cells involved with efflux will have more efflux pumps. So we're overexpression of efflux pumps is, the, is the, the kind of mechanism. If you think about it, a drug inactivating enzyme is probably quite specific. It has to be able to do, uh, to kind of fit the structure, to f cause hydrolysis or whatever the mechanism is, but that's quite specific. So beta-lactamase doesn't work on tetracyclines. It doesn't work on fluoroquinolones, for example. Um, alteration of drug target. If you alter the shape of the ribosome, then tetracyclines don't fit, but that doesn't affect hormones. So if you have a different structure, then that's not going to work. So these two in particular are quite specific. If you've got uh, a modification to the cell wall, that's much more general. Okay, so there's quite a few drugs which, which might be affected by that. Uh, and Efflux pumps, probably in between the two. Some efflux pumps will work on a lot of substrates, some will only work on, a, on a certain substrates. So uh, there are, there's kind of a, a range of different kind of eff eff efficacies, if you like, for these resistance mechanisms. But none of these effort, uh, these kind of uh, uh, mechanisms, none of these four mechanisms, really works on the photodynamic approach because we're entirely different uh, mechanism, entirely different bunch of uh, active sites. So again, I mentioned this yesterday, I think. Um, the 
the deal that the pharmaceutical industries have had since really the, I guess, the 40s and 50s in the last century. Um, it's not really good enough these days for them, for it to be, a, um, in some cases at least, for it to be uh, worthwhile looking for new uh, antimicrobials. If you think about it, what pharmaceutical companies actually want is <clears throat> a very long-term relationship with the patient. They want a, a, like a, a maintenance therapy, something you have to take once a day, twice a day, whatever, for, you know, for as long as you're alive, effectively. So things like cardiac medications, um, some uh, kind of uh, mental health medications, these things, which take a long time. So obviously, you, you have to keep refilling your prescription so that you've got a, an ongoing uh, cost. If <clears throat> antimicrobial prescriptions are going to work, they have to work within, say, a, a week or two weeks. Once they finish working, you no longer need to take them, so the, the company, the drug company, only gets a week or two weeks worth of, of kind of repayment. So the, the deal in terms of, obviously these, these are mega million type uh, arrangements, the deal for pharmaceutical industries is not great in terms of antimicrobials. So the, the argument that they often use is, it's not worth our while to do this. Um, and obviously the bottom line is, they, these are commercial companies, they need to make sufficient uh, money to, to kind of survive. Well, we do get new drugs. Um, the idea is really to target new areas. So you, there's no point targeting an area where you've just found resistance, okay? Because the same thing would, would happen again. You need to find either a, a new target or a new mechanism. And of course, our photoantimicrobials, that this is a new mechanism as far as the, the bacteria are concerned. They're not used to that kind of uh, attack. Um, the example there, that's a fairly famous one. Linezolid was, uh, or Zyvox, was <coughs> the first new chemical structure, chemical class of, uh, of agents for about 50 years, I think, uh, around about the end of the 90s. Um, but again, single site of action on the ribosome, um, and clinical resistance was becoming a, a problem uh, within a year of uh, introduction. So all of the money that went into the development of that is kind of lost because um, it's, it's, you know, once you have resistance, then it's less used. Okay, so this idea of single site of action, single mode of action, actually aids the, the kind of evolution of resistance. Okay? Resistance is, uh, drug resistance is just really uh, evolution in action, if you like. And you can't actually fight evolution. That's the, that's the problem. You might be able to manage it for a while but you can't really stop it. I mentioned uh, Klebsiella before, Klebsiella pneumonia I was talking about before. Um, as I said, gram negatives, uh, all sorts of different resistance mechanisms, particularly the uh, Klebsiella pneumonia carbapenemase, KPC, KPC. It's very, very difficult to treat uh, organisms which have this capability um, with beta-lactams. Okay, so beta-lactams is still the kind of go-to drug for uh, um, antibacterial uh, action. The option, really, once you've got a problem with KPC, is, again, to try a different route. If the cell wall isn't, isn't going to work, then you have to, and these are gram-negative, so they've got an outer membrane, you can attack the outer membrane, and you can get something called uh, colistin or polymyxin, which permeabilizes the outer membrane. It's, it's just a standard um, side antibiotic. It's also quite toxic. So there's always a balance. Right? You might have an effect on the patient, but if you don't use it, is the patient going to die? So that, it's that kind of idea. Um, it's not pleasant to use that, but it's, it still works. Occasionally, there are changes to the outer membrane which actually make, it, make these organisms colistin resistant as well. So once you've got that, then you're in real trouble. Uh, cationic uh, derivatives, particularly, um, well, phenothiazines, thalassinines, porphyrins, as long as they're cationic, these tend to be highly active against um, the gram negatives, so it doesn't matter whether, if we've got uh, KPC expression, it doesn't make any difference because that has no effect whatsoever on our singlet oxygen. It doesn't have an effect on any of these uh, kind of chemical structures, phenothiazines or thalassinines, it doesn't make any difference. 
Um, and so this is uh, one of the new um, thiazines that I've been working on recently, past five years or so. Um, you can see effect in dark. It's a very small effect with uh, increasing concentration. But once you turn the light on, it's, it's pretty rapid, and it will kill uh, Klebsiella pneumonia or Klebsiella oxytoca. These have got uh, resistance mechanisms here, KPC and NDM1, which cause real problems in patients, huge problems. But because you don't have any, any effect on singlet oxygen, obviously there's no effect uh, in terms of resistance. It's very easy to do this. Um, you wouldn't expect that there would be any re resistance to the photodynamic effect, and there isn't. You have to do the work, right? This is a very simple example, just to, uh, to show you <coughs> the idea. The, <coughs> the uh, acridine uh, dye, acridine drug, uh, proflavin, you can see it up here, has been around for ages. It was used, one of the first um, uh, synthetic antibacterial drugs used. It was used in the, in the First World War in about 1916, 1917 to treat um, battlefield injuries where there was infection. Okay, it kind of fell out of use, uh, but as you may know, proflavin is, is also a, another kind of biological stain. It's a very nice fluorescent thing that intercalates with DNA. Uh, we know that the conventional activity in the dark of this material is to intercalate DNA, damage DNA that way, um, and then stop uh, cell synthesis by that way. But it's also uh, a substrate for the Nore pump in Staph hemolyticus. So we thought it'd be a very good idea just to see what happens if we do, the, um, do an incubation in the dark, see how much we need to add to kill the, uh, the bacterium and then try the same thing with blue light. This is activated by blue light. It's a kind of yellow color. Um, so we were actually getting no kill at all. The bacteria were growing quite happily at 100 micromolar, so around about 20 micrograms per mil, which is what you would expect because it, this pump is overexpressed. Flavin goes in, it just gets kicked out straight away. If we do exactly the same experiment with blue light, all the conditions are the same except we illuminate. We get uh, a, a kill down at 0.63 micromolar. So we've gone to, from no kill at 100 micromolar, and now we get complete kill at 0.63. Huge difference. Okay, so what's happening is uh, we get DNA damage, but we get damage at other sites in the cell, cell wall, all the rest of it, because reactive oxygen species are produced on illumination. Very, very simple demonstration of the effect. Okay. Uh, proflavin would not be um, allowed, I don't think, in the clinic because of all the work that's been done on DNA interactions with proflavin. It scares the life out of anyone who's got any kind of regulatory uh, control. Okay. You said yesterday, singlet oxygen knocks out uh, antioxidant enzymes. Um, as we said also yesterday, sometimes the uh, kind of amount of enzyme in, in microbes is, is lower than in normal cell, in human cells, so that also helps us. Uh, but this is just to show the, uh, the kind of enzymogram, if you like, of uh, catalase 1A, incubated with riboflavin. Okay, so this would be incubated by, in ribo, with riboflavin in the dark. This is just the enzyme on its own without any riboflavin. And then increasing light, you can see, causes the damage to the, uh, the catalase. So that's a, an antioxidant enzyme being uh, damaged, uh, inactivated by uh, riboflavin and blue light. And that was published by uh, Ledias in, uh, in Journal of Biological Chemistry. Just a note on biofilms. I don't have uh, much uh, kind of practical experience on biofilms, but it's worth mentioning. Biofilms are very important. And <clears throat> effectively, you, if you have an infection with uh, fungi or with um, bacteria, the bacteria or the fungi are going to be in a biofilm of one sort or another, probably. 
and biofilms are just really communities of whatever it is, bacteria or fungi, um, covered in um, some kind of polysaccharide usually, something like this uh, exopolysaccharide uh, figure here. Um, it is possible to break biofilm using photosensitizers. This is uh, one of the ones that uh, Tim Mace normally talks about, Sapir, uh, which is uh, activated with uh, blue light. If you mix this with, uh, with the biofilm, it actually has a, um, because of its structure, it will actually break the biofilm up, so it, it uh, permeates into the biofilm. Uh, and if you uh, illuminate, then you can uh, take the bacteria out which are in the biofilm. It is obviously going to be more difficult to treat bacteria in a biofilm than it is in, uh, in kind of solution, in suspension. Um, in, in kind of real life, it's going to be a biofilm that you're talking about. So we know we can do that. We know we can still kill bacteria. Um, it may be slightly more difficult in biofilms, but we have the kind of reactive oxygen side of things on the side of the photoantimicrobials, whereas things like penicillins, tetracyclines, etc., don't have that. They have their standard conventional mode of action. So if they can't get into the biofilm, then they won't kill to any kind of uh, degree. So biofilm is worth uh, thinking about in your, when you're designing these things. This is just a, a kind of a, a, a reasonable example, I think. If you think of the, the four kind of stages of penicillin use, penicillin, organisms mainly penicillin sensitive to start off with in the, the mid-40s, uh, problems with uh, simple beta-lactamases, penicillinases up to about the 50s. Then we had problems with penicillin binding proteins in the 60s and 70s, and more recently we have uh, extended spectrum beta lactamases uh, in gram negatives uh, from the 90s onwards, mid 90s. But if you took a sample of each of these at any stage of development, they would always be susceptible to a photosensitizer, cationic photosensitizer, and, uh, and light. Okay, so our approach uh, would work under any conditions. Okay. Now, I said I'd talk about resistance. Don't worry too much about this. It's just to show you that we actually understand, uh, in terms of the kind of molecular side of things, what actually happens. This is the situation with uh, a bacterium building its cross-linked cell wall. Okay, that's the normal situation. So we have the dialanine dialanine dipeptide. Uh, transpeptidase is the enzyme which uh, kind of manages things on and then adds to the incoming peptide so that you get this cross-link formation. Okay, so that's what normally happens when a bacterium is growing. It's in its growth phase. I talked about that yesterday. If you use a kind of penicillin derivative, something like uh, ampicillin or uh, moxicillin, whatever, same idea, but because of the similarity between the beta-lactam drug and the substrate, you can see they look reasonably similar. Um, the transpeptidase will react with the penicillin derivative if you've got enough of concentration there. Okay, and once that occurs, then there's no way forward from that, so it stops the, the process. Exactly the same thing happens when you have beta-lactamase. So beta-lactamase can attack the penicillin derivative or the keflosporin or the carbapenem in exactly the same way. This time, it's the penicillin or whatever that gets uh, inactivated, not uh, the enzyme. And so if you do this, then this will continue because the penicillin or whatever is uh, taken out of circulation. So it's a fairly simple idea. Nothing on that slide affects photosensitizer. Nothing on that slide uh, affects the reactive oxygen species. And so we can see that we can kind of carry on and kill bacteria, no effect. Uh, from this process. Move on to uh, photoantimicrobials and design, etc., for the uh, remainder of this talk, probably a little bit of tomorrow now. <coughs> this list is, um, <coughs> has been around in one form or another, certainly since I started working as a um, kind of medicinal chemist in uh, about 1987, whether it was for anti-cancer or 
in this case for antimicrobials. The, the ideas are more or less the same. It's important to have a pure compound and not a mixture so that you know what it is that's actually doing the job. So you don't want isomers. Um, if you've got isomers, you need to separate them so that you know what, it is, what you've actually got. Um, significant yield of singlet oxygen, really that just means that there is the ability to produce singlet oxygen. Um, I would say that's probably more important than um, just kind of generally reactive oxygen species because of what I said yesterday, the speed of uh, reaction with singlet oxygen, very important. Um, when, certainly when I w began work in the, in the late 80s, I was told to, uh, to test all of the compounds, see how much singlet oxygen they, pr they produce, uh, make a list, so a, a, a ranking order, what's the best, what's the second best, and all the rest, and then the, the best ones that produce singlet oxygen will be taken on for further testing. That's not really that good an idea, but I'll talk about that in a, a little while. If we're looking at photoantimicrobials, we want high selectivity for microorganisms over host cells, over human cells or animal cells, depending on which ones we're looking at. Obviously, we want low toxicity uh, and no mutagenicity in uh, mammalian cells. Um, what we actually want, and this is where it really differs from conventional antimicrobial work, um, what we want is non-specificity in terms of biomolecular targeting. We just want to target the, uh, anti the microbial cell. It doesn't matter where. We don't want to be specific. If you're specific, then you fall into the same trap. You may get a resistance mechanism that comes up, and suddenly you're less effective. This is much better if you can just hit the, the bacterial cell, for example, um, wherever it, it kind of... Uh, it, wherever it lands, really. You don't want to have to be looking for a particular enzyme or whatever. In terms of preference, um, it's obviously going to be uh, useful if the, uh, the compound is water-soluble. If it's not water-soluble, then you're into formulation, and then you're into other complications. You may need to do that, but hopefully uh, you don't need to do that. Uh, light absorption, talked about that earlier. Um, the therapeutic window, same thing again. Um, and photostability is important, really, until you have done the illumination. After that, it's less important. You don't want to illuminate and for the thing to break up. You want it to produce the reactive oxygen species and do the damage, and after that, it's fine. You can, it can uh, decompose or whatever. Um, photostability and general stability is obviously going to be important if this is going to be a clinical uh, proposition. You don't want something that you put in, a, beak, in a, uh, um, a vial or whatever, and then when you come back to it, it's, it's changed color because it's decomposed. That's no good. So the kind of pharmaceutical stability that you'd have to have in conventional agents, same thing here. Now, phenothiazinums are, um, as I said, my kind of ballpark. This is what I've worked in most of the time almost uh, 30 years. Methylene blue up here. All of these different ones have appeared in the literature at some stage or another. Um, this is the one that Mauricio was talking about yesterday very kindly. Uh, and this is the one which um, I'm looking at at the moment. It's been um, tested in uh, um, kind of dental applications here in um, Brazil, in uh, Aracatuba uh, at the moment. We'll talk a little bit about that as well uh, later on. So how do we design a new photoantimicrobial? There are various ways. This is a fairly standard drug development uh, kind of flow chart, if you like. You have an idea or you have a lead structure. You make it, try and make it. If you have made it and it's a new chemical entity, that's good. If it doesn't work, obviously you have to go back. Um, various arguments about when you patent these materials, but patenting obviously is important because you need to be able to uh, kind of, uh, market it to drug companies or uh, biotech companies. Uh, does it produce single uh, reactive oxygen species? Okay, so, and, and if you do a single oxygen test and you don't get anything, then you need to test for the other reactive oxygen species as well. Don't forget that. It may not act by single oxygen. Um, 
biological challenge is really important, I think. Um, as I mentioned before, if you build up a ranking order of photosensitizers that you've made, and you only test the ones that produce the most singlet oxygen uh, in, a, in a test tube or in a cuvette, you may be missing quite a lot. Okay, so it's far more important to test for photo damage, et cetera, in your biological challenge in bacteria or fungi or viruses or whatever it is that you're measuring against. Then obviously we have to have mammalian toxicity. Uh, and after that, if it passes that, then you can go on to kind of preclinical. So that's one way around. Another way around, and this may be obvious, but I don't uh, think it is, the big hurdle for getting from here to here is this. Malian toxicity is really, really expensive, really difficult to get it right. Um, so really, it probably makes more sense to do the mammalian toxicity first. And if you've got something that's not toxic, then you can go into your biological challenge. Okay? Now, that might seem counterintuitive, but this is so huge. You can do all sorts of other stuff here and get really good results, and then you get to mammalian toxicity and you fail at the first step. So all of that work's gone for nothing. So it may be better to get some idea of mammalian toxicity first. The reason I say that is that if you look at the box at the top here, that more or less summarizes what you want for a photoantimicrobial. Okay, so your log P, your, your uh, hydrophilicity, lipophilicity balance between minus 1.5 and plus 2.5. So something like uh, DO15 that Mauricio was talking about yesterday is around about 1.6-ish, 1.6, 1.7 plus. So it fits in there nicely. Positive charge, you said, very important to have a positive charge there if you're going to use, if you want broad spectrum activity in bacteria. And the greater of, uh, use of these things would be usually against bacteria. So don't forget about the gram negative problem. Under max between 400 and 850, and I would probably say um, between 600 and 850. Because again, that gives you the broad spectrum. If you've got uh, blue light, Activated materials, sometimes there may be a problem with endogenous uh, absorbers. So that's uh, something to think about. It needs to be to produce active oxygen species, single oxygen. Again, you can test for that. But all of that, you can more or less predict. Okay, you can build that. If you've got that, then you've probably got that okay. Okay, you know that will work against bacteria and fungi and all the rest of it. Um, so that's why I'm suggesting that mammalian toxicity, or some measure of mammalian toxicity, some indication, um, will be a, a, a kind of step change to do that. So those are the, that, the kind of ways forward, the strategies for uh, moving to, towards the clinic. In terms of the chemical, and, uh, you've got usually three parts to the molecule itself. Obviously, we've got the chromophore. Quite often, and certainly with the methylene blue derivatives, we have oxychromes off the side, which are linked to the chromophore. So all of this gives you the light absorbance uh, and the singlet oxygen production, reactive oxygen species production. Um, then you may or may not have side chains. So side chains will give you uh, novelty. They also improve things like lipophilicity, hydrophilicity. You can get different side chains, give you different properties. But all of that needs to be thought of together. You can't think of each one in, in, in kind of isolation because if you change one, then you change the rest. You can't make a small addition to a molecule and then think that will make a big difference uh, to whatever it, whichever pathway you're looking at, singlet oxygen, for example, because that will have an effect on the whole molecule and it will change other properties. We'll see that in, uh, in a second. The note on uh, testing, this is what we normally use um, very kind of quick and easy way of doing uh, singlet oxygen uh, measurements. So something like TPCPD absorbs at 500. You mix it with your fugitive photosensitizer and illuminate. Hopefully you get some singlet oxygen. It forms this, and then it decomposes to give this, which is absorbs at 290. So this is a kind of a purpley colored solution, and this is colorless. So you can monitor the decomposition of this and that gives you some idea of the rate of production of singlet oxygen. 
So this is uh, a particularly uh, kind of uh, lipophilic compound. So if you're working with lipophilic compounds, that's useful. Uh, this is slightly more, slightly less lipophilic, shall we say. Uh, PIBF, same idea, absorbs at 410, and this absorbs, again, around about 290. So you can monitor decomposition. In terms of lead compounds, this is uh, similar again to uh, ideas I was talking about yesterday. You come up with a, a molecule which you know already produces reactive oxygen species, and then you make derivatives of that. It just means that you have to get into the, the chemistry of that, uh, that uh, kind of stage. So we'll be looking at uh, kind of analog synthesis, uh, kind of homologs, be, uh, making uh, longer carbon chains, for example. Um, very important to have pure compounds. Okay. One of the problems they said yesterday, talk to anyone in the pharmaceutical industry, and you tell them what you do, and they say, well, they're dyes. And they, you can tell, by the way, they say dyes, that they don't think very much of the idea. Um, the, there's this idea that dyes are kind of very non-sophisticated, kind of bucket chemistry. Um, these are impure, um, and they, they're kind of messy and all the rest of it. The requirements for anything which goes into the clinic are the same as a, a conventional uh, pharmaceutical. So we have to have absolute purity. Uh, we can't have any um, kind of side products in there, nothing like that. So purity is very, very important. And it has to be the same as standard pharmaceutical. OK. Um, testing, as I said before, test against biological targets, relevant biological targets. If you're working in dentistry and you're looking at uh, oral disinfection, then use uh, relevant bacteria, which you would find in the mouth. OK? Um, and uh, I'll, well, I'll just do this quick example, then I'll finish, and I'll continue with this bit uh, tomorrow. This was a, 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 was a group of papers in, in JAX, which I uh, kind of discovered right at the start of my uh, work in, in, in Leeds in the late 80s. Um, and mainly because these are uh, Nile Blue derivatives. So as you may know, Nile Blue was a uh, kind of lead compound for a group in, uh, in the States. Um, but these were actually tested as anti-tubercular compounds conventionally. They're not photoactive. Um, but what I was interested in is if you um, vary the uh, alkyl chains here, so methyl, ethyl, propyl, butyl, pentyl, you get a kind of parabolic curve in terms of activity. OK? Um, same on here. Lengthening al alkyl chain, increase in reaction, and then decrease in reaction. OK? So what that means is that you, you can kind of change the properties. You increase, effectively, increasing the log P here. And then it gets to an optimum uh, kind of stage. And then increasing the log P then decreases the activity. So that can be to do with solubility or aggregation, all sorts of things like that. Okay. Now, I'll leave you with that thought for today, because tomorrow I'll continue on the, the photosensitizers, which based on this, this kind of approach, uh, and we can see where that, uh, that leads in terms of design. Okay, any questions? Uh, Good morning, my friend. For, uh, morning. Thank you very much for the presentation. I would like to know, like, uh, can we say that the difference in terms of um, photodynamic therapeutic efficacy between bacterial and eukaryotic cells are related to the structure? Because we know that the bacteria, they just have the cytoplasm and the nucleus are not separated. So therefore, if you activate reactive oxygen species, will it directly damage the nucleus? I'm, I'm sorry, I'm not, I'm not kind of catching what you're saying there, sorry. No, I would like to say, since you said yesterday that the, re, the antioxidant system that's not, is not efficient in bacteria. So I would like to know, like, is the efficacy of PDT in bacteria, made, has it been related to the, the cell structure? Because in terms of cell structure between bacterial cells and mammalian cells, they're completely different. Is there any correlation between the two? Between the, 
the, the relation between the efficacy and the cell structure? Yeah, well, yeah, there must be because the, the bacterial cell, for example, is far more simple. There are, it's far more, um, it's far smaller. So it's, it's very easy to get a high concentration of the compound in there. So therefore, it's very easy to make very high concentrations of reactive oxygen species of whatever kind when you illuminate. So it's very um, it's important to kind of minimize the exposure, if you like, of the patient to the approach. Um, and so if you look at uh, the dental approach, for example, if you're treating, treating gum disease, um, the uh, methylene blue is, is put in, into the pocket, in the gingival pocket, uh, for probably a minute or so. Okay, so there's nowhere near enough time for it to be taken up into uh, the kind of surrounding human cells. Um, but the bacteria will take it up very rapidly. So you can illuminate and the bacteria get the, the kind of full effect, whereas the mammalian cell doesn't kind of uh, doesn't get that. I would like to know, like, uh, since you've mentioned uh, that the, uh, we want to uh, have a safety on the human cells mm -hmm. before, is there any kind of uh, a correlation between the mutational signature, for example, that may arise from resistance? and the different protein modification in terms of efflux pump and all of that. And also, uh, is there drug repurposing uh, an option whereby we can have a drug that may interfere with a mechanism that is in bacteria that is used for a human condition? Um, I think it's, it's possible. I, I don't think it's a good idea. Um, it's, it's similar to if you have a, a conventional anti-cancer agent something like cisplatin, you wouldn't use that for tonsillitis. Okay, you can use, cisplatin will kill bacteria, there's no problem, <laughs> but you wouldn't use it, it's too toxic. So it's that kind of idea, but the, kind of the other way around. Um, it's probably easier if you, if you can try and keep the two strains, anti-cancer PDT and antimicrobial PDT, try and keep them apart. Um, it's probably, uh, also, I mean, on a, from another aspect, it's easier if you concentrate in one area and don't cry and try and spread across. You, you kind of make more strides if you concentrate in, on anti-cancer, for example. Hello. <laughs> uh, thank you very much. That uh, was very cool. Uh, do you think it's possible to target a specific pathogen uh, and not harm the rest of the biome? Uh, well, yeah, I mean, you, you can... Um, you can certainly um, kill uh, gram positives and leave the gram negatives alone just by using the kind of mechanism that I mentioned. If you use a, uh, an anionic porphyrin, for example, then you'll kill any gram positives around, but any gram negatives, they'll be perfectly happy kind of growing away. It, it, that's, if you want more selectivity than that, then you probably need to go into uh, kind of peptide uh, targeting, attach that to your molecules so that you have, uh, they can interact with receptors on a specific type of cell. Okay, it's that kind of, but kind of gross gram positive, gram negative, that's not really a, really a problem. Thank you, Prof. Prof, please, you said that the big lactamylase and the transpeptidase has no effect in the resistant development of the photodynamic inactivation. Yep. Please, yep. can you explain more about them? Explain, sorry. Can you throw more light about the, why it has no effect in the resistance? Yeah, sure, sure. Um, I'll see if I can find the relevant. All of this, this is just showing how a bacterial cell manages to uh, reinforce its, the, the, the cell wall. Okay? So it does that by forming this cross-link so that has nothing to do with, if, again, if we take methylene blue, we use that against a bacterial cell, none of this has anything to do with methylene blue. The transpeptidase doesn't work on methylene blue. The structure is incorrect. It doesn't look anything like this kind of uh, dipeptide. Okay. Um, in here, if we had um, transpeptidase and methylene blue, there will be no interaction in terms of chemical reaction like this, but if we illuminate, then probably the transpeptidase would be damaged anyway. 
Um, and beta-lactamase, again, same thing. Beta-lactamase has nothing to, to kind of affect methylene blue, so it, it can't damage the methylene blue molecule, so there's, there's no effect. It's still able to act as a photosensitizer. Um, and so uh, we would get photo damage here with methylene blue or with a, a porphyrin or a thalassine or whatever um, because they, the structures involved are completely different. So that was the, the main idea. Okay. Let's thank Professor Mark again.